Hi, my name is Jack. I was saved from a past of abuse, addiction, the new age, the occult, and eventually practicing ritual magic in a Freemason lodge, and Jesus Christ saved me. Um, and now, by God's grace, I get to sit here with my beloved brother, Chuck, who's been such an encouragement to me, a mentor, just continually points me to Christ and the sufficiency of scripture. And he's here with me today uh, because his testimony truly glorifies God, as all do. But I hope that in him sharing, it will point you to Christ and it will encourage you to look to him. So, Chuck. Well, I am Chuck Holmes. I'm uh, my my day job is I'm the founder and director of Mount Nebo Prison Ministry, located in Gilbert, Arizona, and we're a teaching ministry to the incarcerated. Uh, we our desire from the beginning was to penetrate every prison in the country with the gospel, with the saving news of Jesus Christ, and then provide biblically based teaching for those that believe. So we're a discipleship ministry. We've been doing this for almost 30 years now, and uh, it's been a real blessing. How I got into this ministry was really looking back, started as a juvenile as, uh, as I began to go south, as they say, in my early years. And at 13 years old, was arrested for a string of car thefts put in uh, juvenile detention where I, I spent a year. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a very strange time as a young kid to, uh, to be in a dormitory with 60, 70 other kids that were the age from 12 to 18 years old. It was there that I, that I witnessed what can happen to those incarcerated, young kids that were raped and molested. Uh, a lot of violence, and I got out of there with a reputation at 15 years old and kind of continued along those lines until I was faced uh, by the court to either go into service uh, or end up in jail again, so I, I chose a service. And I remember going up to my dad and said, okay, I'm tired of people telling me what to do, and I'm going to go into Marine Corps. And so he looked at me, and the light is not on in this kid's eyes. So anyway, I joined the Marine Corps when I turned 17. That was back in the mid-60s. Uh, Vietnam was picking up steam at that time. I spent uh, almost two years stateside. I went to school to be an electrician. I was an MP for a while. And then I got my orders to go to Vietnam. In December of 67, I landed in Vietnam. Now, prior to that, I had got three meritorious promotions in the Marine Corps. Uh, I loved the Marine Corps. It was what they call gung-ho. And I wanted to get over to Vietnam. Uh, and I won't go into the details in Vietnam. I will just say that after 13 months, uh, 10 months of that in the jungle, uh, I became very calloused, hard-hearted, some of the things I witnessed in Vietnam and took part in uh, really was a beginning point to my conscience and my, my heart just growing very hard. And I came back, I had married my childhood sweetheart before going to Vietnam, Sandy, and we reported into Camp Pendleton and the other thing started happening in Vietnam was I began to use drugs, smoking weed to begin with then uh, moved to the harder drugs, opium, and I came back from Vietnam with a heroin habit. And I came back with a, with a large stash of heroin. And so Sandy and I reported in and got a, got a little house in San Clemente, California, and I was already strung out on heroin. I was running down to Mexico on the weekends and partying in Tijuana. Sandy got pregnant, and after about six months, uh, she left. And it was a short time later that uh, I was arrested for drug use and being a wall from the Marine Corps and tossed into the Camp Pendleton Brig. As far as I know, I'm the only man that ever escaped from the Camp Pendleton Brig up till that time. Uh, was getting ready to go to Cap Canada with some draft dodgers and deserters 
and got picked up in Fresno, California under the influence of barbiturates, taken back to the brig. And I was put in put in the captain's office as I waited for him to assign where I was going to go after my escape. And he came in and we had a confrontation. Uh, he wanted me to get at attention and I wouldn't do it. And I was a very angry, violent, volatile person at that time. Anyway, he had a couple of uh, MPs take me in a back room and that began really what was a series of uh, some treatments to change my attitude. Uh, hung me upside down, urinated on me, beat me, and after about six hours I, I told them I was ready to comply. And they took me back in, got the captain up, up and he came in, and within just a couple minutes all that anger and hate came back and I ended up spitting on him. They put me in a strip cell and you were supposed to be in there for a week, two weeks, three weeks, 30 days was the maximum because it was uh, inhumane. And I uh, assaulted a guard while I was in there, uh, wouldn't change my attitude. Things happened, they'd come by and uh, hose me down at night, turn fans on me, put me on diminished rations, a potato and some cabbage. Well, 30 days went by, and 90 days went by, and six months went by. And I had never been suicidal, but I, out of vengefulness, I decided that rather than face a couple of court martials and continue like this, I was just going to kill myself. Well, I had a letter snuck out with a guy that was getting out and sent to my parents and just telling them what had happened. And because uh, providentially of some congressional interest at Camp Pendleton at the brig at that time, there was a guard that was hung in the mess hall, race riots, rape, murders. Uh, when they got that letter, they got a hold of a congressman in Northern California, and because of some inquiries he made, all of a sudden when they showed up at my strip cell one day. Uh, I had been in there eight months and they opened the door and I hadn't let them cut my hair, uh, was looking a little crazy. And they told me I was getting out. And I really thought they were there to kill me and wouldn't come out of the cell. And they had to bring a chaplain up to talk me out. And two days later, after four years in the Marine Corps, uh, I was given an undesirable discharge and they gave me the boot. I ended up, I had a daughter born, Kelly, while I was in the brig. I still remember him throwing a piece of paper in my cell and on it was written, your, your wife had a daughter. That was my birth announcement for my, for my daughter. And anyway, they were back in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I went back there and was working for a couple months and things were going good. And then I decided, you know what, I can, uh, I can smoke a little weed on the weekend and have a few beers. And it didn't take long for that to pick up steam and Kelly asked me to leave and I found myself on the uh, streets of Minneapolis, St. Paul with a, with a growing drug habit and ran into a couple of friends of mine that I had joined the Marine Corps with and they were into pulling arm robberies. And they were getting ready to do one that night and asked me if I'd like to go along and I said I would and Right away, I've, I found that adrenaline rush that was always big in my life, that uh, anything for excitement. And that first robbery, I ended up with $10,000 and next day had a place and transportation and drugs. And we were pulling, we went from three of us to five of us. I carried a sawed off shotgun and a 45 and I was very serious about my business and I look back today and I'm thankful that that nobody ever got killed because every one of us was prepared to kill someone if we had to and so we were taking down supermarkets uh, every other weekend in the Twin Cities I had dresser drawers filled with money living life in the fast lane partying well my friends decided they wanted to start hitting banks and that first bank robbery, I couldn't go, I was sick. 
I had hepatitis. I weighed about 135 pounds. I was bright yellow. And that first bank robbery, uh, they got partial ident partially identified, got a partial number on the license plate, and there was a manhunt in the Twin Cities for, for my crime partners. So I decided to leave town. The only thing I took with me was a, was a big parachute sack full of, uh, full of money. I had about thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. I don't remember how much it was. And I flew back to California, and I hooked up with a friend of mine that I had met in Vietnam, and he had a cabin up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And for three months, we just commenced to party. And anybody who's had a drug or alcohol problem knows that no matter how much money you have, eventually it runs out, and it did. And I got up one, one Saturday morning and uh, got a 12-gauge shotgun and sawed it off, and that early evening I drove over to San Jose, and from San Jose to San Francisco along the Bay Bayshore High Freeway, I robbed six or seven motels and went back to the cabin in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the next week on a Sunday night at two in the morning, loaded, I drove down to Santa Cruz and looked for something to rob. The only thing I could find was a donut shop. And so I went in and stuck him up for $8 and six Long John donuts. A couple blocks from the donut shop, I got lit up and was pulled over and found myself in a Santa Cruz County Jail. For the next week and a half, two weeks, I went through lineups. They identified me for a dozen armed robberies. Most of them I had committed, some I hadn't. And at 20, 21, 22 years old, looking like I was 18 years old, uh, I went to sentencing. And I still remember my dad sitting behind me, and when the judge said five to life, I can remember the, the wind being sucked out of my dad. I was afraid. I had heard stories about prison. I knew it was going to be a rough place, but I thought once they find out I'm a former Marine, Vietnam veteran, uh, notorious donut bandit, that, that I would be welcomed in. But that's not the way that culture is in there. Uh, it's a food chain mentality. They have guys in there that make their living off of fear and intimidation. In fact, they can literally smell fear. In that first two or three weeks, I had a, some confrontations. I went in looking young, weighing about 140 pounds. Uh, and one night on the yard, this was one confrontation, I had a couple guys come up to me and give me a list with some items on it. And they told me, when you go to the commissary, you're going to get these items for us and you're going to give them to us. And I remember laying in my cell that night and just going, I'm never going to come out of here because I'm either going to be killed or I'm going to have to kill somebody. And I had a job at the electric shop, and uh, there was an elderly Latino guy there that, that took a liking to me and said, I know you're having some trouble on the yard, and you're going to need to deal with it. And he gave me a prison shank. And I remember going out that night and finding these two guys on the yard and just went up and, and told them, I don't know what you see in my eyes, but whatever it is, you're mistaking and I'm not going to do my time like that, so let's just deal with it. Well, I don't know if I put much fear in these guys, but they moved on to easier prey. And then I found something out uh, that, that fear is a great motivation. And really out of fear, I started going out on the weight pile for two, three hours every day, eating everything I could get my hands on. And in five or six months, I put on 50 pounds, I got buffed. I uh, commenced to change a few dental records for guys that were giving me a hard time and establish myself on the prison yard. And initially I, I went to AA and NA and stress control and anger management, looked into uh, TA and even, even on the fringes of the occult, 
looking for answers because I knew if I ever went up, came out of prison again that I never wanted to come back. I had great intentions. Well, some years later, I did come out of prison and, in fact, had reestablished my relationship with Sandy and my daughter Kelly, and they came out to San Jose. And uh, when I got out and uh, was working and doing a family life, and really things were really good for a couple months. And then I decided, you know what, I can smoke a little weed on the weekends and have a few beers. And that escalated once again, and within a couple months, uh, Sandy left with Kelly and went back to the Twin Cities, and I found myself going to the bars. And I'd never been a big drinker, but I found out a couple things in the bars. One is that if you go to the same bar enough, they know you, and they'll call you by name. And uh, in all that anger and all that hatred that was so much a part of who I was was still there, and in a bar, there's always some jerk besides me. And I started getting in fights, and uh, serious fights. And for a year, sometimes on a blackout, I'd, I'd get in barroom brawls in the San Jose area. Some mornings I'd wake up and have blood on me or a broken knuckle and, and not even remember what happened and would have to call someone. That culminated in me one night in a, in a bar stabbing a guy, and I went back to prison. And this time there was no fear. Uh, I wasn't looking for answers anymore. I went, did a few programs, so when I appeared before the parole board, I, I could look like I was trying to uh, rehabilitate. And some years later, I stepped out of that prison and managed to complete my parole, and I was off parole for just a few days. And in a large country western bar in San Jose, I uh, got in a fight with a number of guys, stabbed two guys, and went back to prison. And that's the revolving door that I was in, had accumulated 14 years in, in prison in, California, in the California penitentiaries. So when I got out that last time, I, uh, I found out I didn't have to rob people or steal, that I could manipulate people. And I became a master manipulator. Uh, in fact, Laura, who I'm married to now, we've been married 39 years. She initially was one of those victims. She had a job and a house, which qualified her. And at that time, I was shooting speed, uh, IV drug user. So every day, dealing drugs, slinging drugs, uh, still did some burglaries, and put Laura th through that emotional abuse and neglect for, for a number of years. She had two kids, which were my stepchildren, and we had a son together, Daniel. And this is where I just want to make it very clear where, where I had gotten to. I was a man with no conscience. Everybody that came across my path was a victim. I only had one interest in people, and that's for what I could get from them. I woke up every day with a desire to get high, and there's nothing I wouldn't do to fulfill that desire. And one day I got up, and shortly after I told Laura I was gonna run out and get a pack of cigarettes and left and went and picked up a, a hooker I knew and left San Jose and drove out to Mesa, Arizona. Never called home, no concerns about my eight, nine month old little blonde curly head boy at home. No concerns for Laura. And she would say it was the repeat of many years of her waiting for the phone to ring, thinking she heard my truck and look out the drapes, not knowing if I was dead or alive, worried, trying to find me. Well, after after some time in Mesa, the, the lady I was with moved, left, and the money ran out. So I, I called Laura and conned her into quitting her job of 14 years 
and bring in the kids and come out to Mesa because I had changed and things were going to be different. And she believed that lie be, because she loved me. And she came out and for another three, four years went through that same emotional abuse and neglect as I continued to, uh, to do speed every day. And in July of 1989, I, I was arrested for selling a stolen motor home to an undercover police officer in Mesa. And even though I'd given him a fantastic deal on it, uh, I was arrested and should make it very clear when I got into the squad car that day, there was absolutely no fear. It was just a long, long line of, of squad cars, shackles and handcuffs in my life. The only thought I had when I got into that police car the only thought it wasn't for my wife, my son Daniel, my kids. It, well, the only thought I had was, I hope I get booked in time for lunch. Because I knew if I missed lunch, I'd have to go to dinner to eat. The only thing I cared about. And as they put me in the booking cell, I crawled under a bed and waited for him to call my name. And as I laid there, 40 years old, a man without a conscience, had no capacity to care for anybody. The only thing that mattered in my life was me. And as I laid there, something very foreign began to happen. All of a sudden, my conscience became, began to come alive. And as I laid there, for three hours, there was just an increasing weight of guilt. I began to see all the years and all the faces and all the people in that line of victims in my life, some without faces, people that had come across my path that I hurt to one degree or another, physically, emotionally, and as I laid there and looked at that long, long, long line of victims in my life, I became overwhelmed with this sense of guilt. It's like it came out of nowhere. Looking back, I understand what it was. It was the Holy Spirit bypassing a flawed conscience and bringing me face to face with who I really was, not who I thought I was. And at the end of that two, three hours of just being overwhelmed with that sense of guilt, I cried out, God help me. It was a God I didn't know. Nobody had ever shared the gospel with me. I knew nothing about Christ. I had looked for, for answers in a number of places initially. Uh, even in the occult and the Rosicrucians. And uh, there was, uh, back in the 70s, a guy named Carlos Castaneda who met a guy named Don Juan and they were into astral projection and you take peyote. So on the fringes of the occult and looking for answers. And I got booked and I, I had started weeping and I hadn't cried. I couldn't remember the last time I'd cried and just started weeping uncontrollably. And they booked me and I came into the tank and I'd been a, a racist, a, an active racist for over 20 years, affiliated with the, with the Aryan Brotherhood and the Klan and hated people. And I walked in and I saw the ink and who's who and the gangs and I'm trying to hide my face, hide my tears and I sat down on a bunk in a cell and just put my head in my hands. And there was a guy sitting there, young kid, his name was Sean, 25 years old, good looking young, young man. And he just looked at me and said, it looks like you're having a hard day. And all I could get out was I'm a horrible person. And he had a Bible and he opened it and he, he just began slowly and methodically to walk me through what the Bible said. 
He said, I think you're being convicted right now of your sin. He said, there's a God and he's a holy God. And he's a just God and he hates sin. And he told me that if I was to die in my sin and step into eternity, that I would be judged by God for that sin and that I would be sent to a place, a literal place called hell. And that would be forever. And he gave me a biblical description of what holiness is and righteousness and sin and a biblical description about hell as good as I've ever heard to this day. In fact, I remember thinking I felt bad before I started talking to this guy. But then he took me to the cross and he told me about Jesus Christ and what he'd done, that he had went to the cross as a perfect sacrifice for sin, that on that cross, God the Father had treated him as though he lived my life. And that if I would trust in Christ, he would treat me as though I had lived Christ's life. There would be an exchange. I would get Christ's righteousness, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Be totally cleansed. My destination would no longer be hell, but it would be heaven. That I would be made a new creation that God would give me a new heart and put new principles within me. And I just said, give me Jesus. And for me, it was a radical conversion. I remember right away looking out in the, t in the tank over those next days and seeing blacks and Latinos that for years I could never look at without a hatred and an anger. And it was just gone. It wasn't a process. It wasn't a program. I didn't have to walk myself through it. God took that. He changed my language. I was one of the most vulgar people you'd never want to sit next to at IHOP. Uh, I could empty out the restaurant in about five minutes. I was intentionally loud, vulgar, abrasive, and hoped you didn't like it. I would even order shirts from mercenary magazines with all kinds of racial slurs and vulgarity on them. And he changed my language like that. It wasn't a process. I didn't have to work on my speech. He took that from me. And there was things that, uh, like I had bit my fingernails since I was a kid. I was 40 years old, bit my fingernails down to the nubs. And from the time I met Christ, he just took that away. I began to get on the phone and I called Laura and she was already packed up and getting ready to go back to San Jose. It was a marriage. It was never a marriage. I had no capacity to love or care for anybody. She was a victim. I got on the phone and, and called her and I had no theology. All I knew was Jesus saved me. He was real. He'd forgiven me. And my life was different. And she would tell you that she'd heard every con and every lie. But she would tell you she heard something different in my voice that day. And all that call was made in tears. And I called my mom and dad who, who were in their 70s, who didn't live far from us. I couldn't remember the last time that I had told them I loved them or hugged them. The only time I went over to see them was to put the touch on them or something. And I remember calling and and in tears, just telling them how sorry I was for the pain I'd caused and the hurt. Watch parents who watch their children go down a road of destruction and chaos and can't do anything but weep and hope. And my folks weren't Christians, so they didn't have God's ear. They didn't go to God in prayer. My mother just suffered that hurt for many years. Well, I began to pray that God would, would let me out for a short time. I knew I was going back to prison. I was okay with that. But that he would let me out on bail so I could go and face to face 
tell my loved ones how sorry I was, ask for their forgiveness, and tell them about Christ. Well, I was in county three weeks waiting for a second bail reduction hearing, and somebody gave me a Bible, and I began to read that Bible 16 hours a day. See, now I had the author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, living inside me. And as I read it, those truths jumped off the page at me. Things like, you're a new creation in Christ. Behold, the old things have passed away and all things are new. And I thought, that is me. I am a new creation. I remember struggling. <clears throat> I had gone through the stealth. 12-step program a few times, and I remember that, thinking that uh, I would needed to go make amends for all the people I'd hurt, for the houses I'd burglarize, uh, and remember wrestling with that and thinking, Lord, I'll get a hundred years if I be begin to do that. And I remember turning to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and reading those words, you who stole, steal no longer, but with your hands work and give to those that have a need. I literally thought God slipped that in there just for me. In that first three weeks as I read God's word and those truths just really exploded on my mind. When I got arrested, I was what you would call a burnout, could barely have a cognitive thought or string a couple sentences together. And very quickly, through the spirit and God's word, he began to renew my mind. Well, I did get out on bail for four months. I got to see my mom and dad who were Catholics. I got to see my wife, Laura, my brother, my sister and her husband in that four months all come to Christ in repentance and faith. God used what they saw in my life to bring them to a saving faith. So I got, I was supposed to get 10 years. I remember going to court and, uh, it was just a wonderful four months being in our first church, uh, being able to express now a heart for, for my wife that I, I had the capacity to love her and my kids, spending time with my mom and dad. Uh, those were just a great four months and God just filled me up with whatever I needed to get through for the next years I'd be in prison. Uh, he was very gracious in giving me that. I was supposed to get 10 years and uh, God graciously gave me two years. And I went in as a brand new Christian on a prison yard. And it was strange. I remember the third night on a prison yard, I, some guys came up and said, hey, you wanna come out on the yard tonight and pray with us? And I said, absolutely. And there I was in a big circle of 15, 20 guys holding hands with blacks and Latinos, praying to a God that just a few months before I didn't know. And he had put me in a cell with a guy who had some teaching tapes by a pastor named John MacArthur. And I began to listen to the Word of God 16 hours a day. And for two years, I listened to over 4,000 messages, got grounded in God's Word. And when I came out, decided I wanted to have an impact on Arizona prisons. And now 30 years later, we're in every state in the country and 800 plus prisons that we pour materials into. Not because of who I am, but because of who our God is. He is real. And I can tell you right now, I have no idea, Jack or I have no idea who will hear this video. We know God will use it as he wishes. But I would just tell you right now that the biggest problem that man has, the biggest problem you have, is that God is holy. He's a holy God, and he hates sin. And every one of us is a sinner. We're born sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because that's who we are by nature. We come into this world separated from God, God-haters. And God is a perfectly just God. He can't wink at sin. He can't just say that's okay. He will judge sin. He's a righteous judge. 
And if you were to step into eternity today, and you might be a very good person, a benevolent person, you might even be very moral and religious, or you might be on the other side of that, like me, a drug addict, maybe delving into the occult, looking for answers, looking for that peace that everybody wants. But if you step into eternity today, the Bible says man's appointed once to die, then judgment. There is no reincarnation. It's not if at first you don't succeed, die, die again. There is no soul sleep or annihilation. Every person will stand before a holy God and be judged for their sin. And if you step into eternity with your sin, you will go to a place called hell forever, for eternity. You'll never pay for the smallest sin you'll have committed. It's strictly punitive. It's strictly punishment. See, we've sinned against an infinite holy God, so the punishment has to match the crime, and it'll be infinite. After 30-something years as a believer, if I could get rid of the doctrine of hell, I would. It's hard to get my mind around it. It's an horrific place. But that's where God saves sinners. But Christ. Christ came and became the perfect sacrifice for sin. If you cry out in repentance and faith, repentance means acknowledging, confessing you're a sinner and willing to turn from that sin and trust in Jesus Christ and who he said he was and what he did. He went to the cross, was a perfect sacrifice, paid the penalty for every sin ever committed by every person that would ever believe. And if you trust in Christ, he will make you a new creation. You will be guaranteed of a different destination, a destination in heaven, in his presence, with unending, increasing awe and joy throughout eternity. So I would just ask you, wherever you're at, seriously consider Wherever you're looking for answers and you think there's wisdom and light in those places, that's false. It's the wisdom of the world. It will only end up taking you to places you don't want to go. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He said, come on to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you Rest for your souls. That's a legitimate invitation. I pray you'd come to Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, Chuck. I've been so extremely encouraged to have Chuck Holmes as a brother, as a friend. You continuously point me to God's word, to mm. the sufficiency of scripture, to the truth of the gospel, both the parts that are hard um, and the good news of the gospel. So I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for what God's done in your life because it's amazing to me how he can use even the sinful, rebellious things that we did and in his sovereignty, how your story brings him glory mm -hmm. and points ultimately to how good and gracious and merciful our God is. So thank you so much. Well, you're welcome, Jack. Yeah. And I could sum up my feeling for Jack with a simple ditto. <laughs> yeah. so you're Praise welcome. God. Um, and in the description, I will put things about Mount Nebo Prison Ministry. Um, it's I'm so thankful for that. And we're going to be doing a video next asking some questions to dear Chuck. So thank you so much for watching. And we are going to pray for you right now. Father, I do, I pray that anyone who uh, you show this video to, that wherever they're at, uh, there might even be a feeling they're, they're too far gone. Mm -hmm. They've hurt too many people. They're, they're in bondage to, to drugs or an alcohol or sex or a number of different things that, uh, that, that just grab our hearts and hold us. But Lord, you're the, you're the great sin breaker and the sin bearer and I pray that you would take the gospel they just heard that your spirit would penetrate their hearts 
that they were under, understand that you are a God of love and mercy and grace and that you will not only change their lives, but uh, you will give them the power to resist sin, to actually love you and love others, and you would change their eternal destiny. So, Lord, do what only you can do. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.